All right, so now we are hopping into Genesis 4. We get to Cain, Abel, and Seth. So, Genesis 4, reading from New Living Translation. Now, Adam slept with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. Okay, so pretty, pretty straightforward sentence there. Um, but you see that they did procreate physically. Uh, she became pregnant. When the time came, she gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the Lord's help, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to a second son and named him Abel. Okay, so we see that they have known each other. He sleeps with, with Eve and she becomes pregnant. Um, then when the time came, she gives birth to Cain, who is the firstborn, the older. And she says, this is not something that I have done. This is something that God has helped me to experience. With the Lord's help, I have brought forth a man, not from my own ability, but from the ability and potential God has placed in me. From him blessing me, I have brought forth a man. Yes, painful childbirth, which you have to assume because that was part of the consequence uh, from Genesis 3. But, man, that's a big deal. She gives birth to Cain. It says, with the Lord's help. So, she's not saying, we're cut out of the garden here. I think that that shows immediately that, that Adam and Eve still... Uh, rely on God, the Lord. She calls him the Lord. So they still have that relationship, even though they're banished from that specific presence in the Garden of Eden, in that perfect physical fellowship with God there, that heaven on earth, if you will. Um, that's an amazing thing to notice. I've never really noticed that. With the Lord's help. With the Lord's help. Not with God's help, not with this impersonal, with the Lord, the one that I serve, the one who is almighty, the one who is sovereign, the one who um, gives life and sustains life, the Lord, the almighty, the awesome, awesome God, with the Lord's help, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to a second son and named him Abel. So they have two sons, Cain is the older, Abel is the younger. When they grew up, so time passes. Abel became a shepherd while Cain was a farmer. So notice this. You have Cain following in this cultivating of the land, just like his father, Adam. Um, Abel becomes a shepherd. So showing that um, dominion over animals, which is part of what God put into creation. So that's still being modeled. That's awesome. But it's the first time we see anything of a shepherd. Mm. Um, okay. At harvest time, this is the time to gather the harvest and the crop, Cain brought to the Lord a gift of his farm produce, while Abel brought several choice lambs from the best of his flock. So notice here um, that when it's, it's harvest time, Cain does bring a gift of farm produce to the Lord. So Cain brings a gift of his farm produce for the Lord, Abel brought several choice lambs from the best of his flock. So Abel's also bringing a gift. A gift. It's just that it's the best. Um, the Lord accepted Abel and his offering, but he did not accept Cain and his offering. This made Cain very angry and dejected. Now, this is important. Both bringing offerings, um, but the Lord accepts Abel's because, like, it's pleasing to him. He's brought the best in this choice, uh, the choice of his flock. But Cain, no, not so much. I didn't accept Cain's offering, says the Lord. This makes Cain very angry and dejected. So notice, Cain is very angry and dejected. It calls forth these feelings. That's big. Man, this is about to, to get really big. I, maybe we know where this is going. Uh, but, oh, feelings are a really, really um, the focus right there. This made Cain very angry and dejected. Rejected. His face was downcast. Yes, wrath. His countenance fell. Oof. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked him. Why do you look so dejected? Notice that the Lord's meeting him in those feelings. The Lord's coming to him. He says, why are you so, why are you feeling this way? He's trying to get Cain to recognize how and why he's feeling, right? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you respond in the right way. He's saying, look, you're hanging your head and you're getting all grumpy and stuff, but like you know what's pleasing and good and right. 
and you will be accepted. Your gift will be accepted. Your offering will be if you respond in the right way. So if you respond in the right way, which is God saying, hey, you're not responding in the right way. You know the thing to do, and right now you're responding poorly. You're not giving an offering of first fruits, basically, is what we're learning. Um, except that if you respond in the right way. But if you refuse to respond correctly, then watch out. So God's giving another warning, just like he warned before. Well, I give you a warning. Don't eat from this tree. Oh, you did? Mm, here's the consequence. This is God stopping and giving a warning when feelings are present in Cain. Because he's giving an offering, but it's the not the right kind of offering. It's not an offering with the right heart, is really what we're finding out in this. But this is so crazy. If you refuse to respond correctly, then watch out. Here's your warning. If you don't, okay, you're not going to be accepted. It's not going to be good and pleasing. Okay, watch out. Sin is waiting to attack and destroy you. You must subdue it. Sin is waiting to attack and destroy you. Okay? Your feelings, that's this gateway into this. This sin is just ready to destroy you and tear you apart. Okay? You've got to subdue it. You've got to subdue these feelings <laughs> of being angry and dejected. Later, Cain suggested to his brother Abel. This is after God's warning and God meeting him where he is at and in his anger and in his dejectedness and offering a way to, to escape that. But we see that Cain does not take this. Later, Cain suggested to his brother Abel, let's go out into the fields. And while they were there, Cain attacked and killed his brother. Now notice, God said in verse 7, sin is waiting to attack and destroy you, and you must subdue it. And that's exactly what Cain does to Abel. Cain becomes a sin in that. Cain attacked and killed his brother. That's, that's crazy. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? Right? Where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain retorted. Am I supposed to keep track of him wherever he goes? Am I my brother's keeper? Basically. Which is a lie. Obviously, and the Lord calls him. He says, but the Lord said, what have you done? God knows what he has done, but here again, just like he asked Adam, like, well, where did you hear that? What have you done? Why are you hiding? Where are you? All right? Why have you hidden? It's the same thing. What have you done? I need you to consider what you've done, okay? And I want you to know that I know, but I need you to know why and the consequences of this, and that's what he's laying out here. What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Listen. I want you to know that this should haunt you because this haunts me what you have done. I want you to know that that exists, that you think it's over and done. You've lashed out and destroyed him and he is no more. And yet, this legacy and the consequence of your sin will haunt you forever as it haunts me, as it haunts all of creation now recorded here. Boom! Oof, that is tough. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You are hereby banished from the ground you have defiled with your brother's blood. Okay, because you've done this, now I have to banish you from here. Here was good. Here is not as good as the garden, but there's a reason for that. And now you're going to have to get separated again. And I think that maybe this ties in again with separating light from darkness. Good from evil, right? I mean, I don't know. Something that pops into my head here that's been a pattern so far. Oof, you're banished from the ground, you would defile with your brother's blood. No longer will it yield abundant crops for you, no matter how hard you work. No matter how hard you work, there's nothing you can do. It's not going to produce abundant crops for you. Uh, from now on, you will be a homeless fugitive on the earth, constantly wandering from place to place. Look, you had a home, you had a family, you had provision, and you had blessings, and you... That's gone now, buddy. I gave you a warning. I told you what was right. I told you you needed to subdue that. But unfortunately, you're, the sin got you. And you became sin. And now I've got to separate you.
from this goodness, from these blessings. And here's the curse. Cain replies to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from land and from your presence. You have made me a wandering fugitive. All who see me will try to kill me. Oh, man. So again, you see this pattern of, of like pointing and, and putting this blame, and you did, you did. Just like Adam said, she did, and it's your fault for making a woman or even putting a tree there, and Eve saying, well, I, yes, I did, but it's because he tricked me. Like, I'm not completely to blame. They're not being held accountable. You see this natural response, which is still in us today, um, of trying to justify or trying to say, well, I can't. This is not fair, and you, right, oh, man. Cain replies to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me to bear. I can't bear this, Lord. Why would you do this to me? You've banished me from my land and from your presence. You have made me a wandering fugitive. God's like, no, no, no. You brought this on yourself, buddy. Like, <laughs> I didn't make you this. I warned you. I gave you a way of escape, is, is what I'm reading and thinking in this. Uh, he made You made me a wandering fugitive. All who see me will try to kill me. So all who see me will try to kill me. This makes me question a couple of things. The only people that we know of right now are Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Abel is no more, so he is not able to see him or, or try to kill him now. Like, the parents, I wouldn't see doing that. So he says, all who see me will try to kill me, which makes me think there are other people. They see... This is interesting, trying to read this fresh and not think about any, anything that, that we might have learned. It's really confusing in certain areas, um, and it should be, and that's good because we ask the questions and we learn. Um, but this makes me think there are more people because, like earlier in the creation account, like it says uh, in Genesis 1, 27, it says, So God created people in his own image. God patterned them after himself. Male and female, he created them. Them is plural. It doesn't say there's only two. Like, we get that account of, of going uh, the man and the woman in Eden. It's focusing on those two. Um, and while I would say, yes, those are the first two, those are the first two that are mentioned, those are the first two that are formed. Um, he gives this command to multiply. Uh, you've got, oh, sorry, all of these animals and all of these uh, these life forms that God has formed and created. Um, but it doesn't like discard the idea that there are more than that. It's just this is the choose of, of the choosing of focus, I guess. You know what I mean? I don't know. This this is hard to reconcile in my mind a little bit. But since Cain says here, all who see me will try to kill me, I think him referencing all, right? I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. The fact that he's thinking, whoever finds me, if I'm wandering around with no home, whoever else finds me, that there must be others. And that makes me think, well, God made people in his own image. And, like, we know about Adam and Eve and, and like, their offspring here because this is the first family and the relationship that we're following um, and where sin came from. Um, but that's not to say that God could not have formed other people. It's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing to get this creation story and not get hung up on little small details like that. But I'm going to move forward, and that's the way that I am making peace with it right now. Um, but I'm, I'm sure this is going to lead to some interesting discussion. Um, okay, all who see me will try to kill me. So, others. Any other people that God has made in their image. Whether there's other people or not, or whether Cain's just foreseeing that there will be lots of other people who are technically relatives, um, that, I don't know, That's, we'll keep moving. The Lord replied, they will not kill you, for I will give seven times your punishment to anyone who does. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So he puts this mark of Cain on him, and this is interesting, um, because he's saying, they're not going to try to kill you. I'm still going to protect you, okay? Like, it's enough that you're going to have to toil in this, and that you're going to deal with this punishment, okay? But I can still use you, which he, he does, um, but this is interesting that he says, I'm going to put this mark of Cain. It's going to be a warning to anyone who might try to kill you, okay? 
sin begets sin begets sin. Like I don't, I'm trying to break some of this pattern here. Like God gives them a warning. Um, anyone that might try to kill him. And that's interesting that also this, this just popped in my head. Like you've got this pattern of, of people like half acknowledging, half being accountable or confessing something, but not the full reality of it. Um, he's saying, you know, this is, you've made me this, you've done this. Um, and then Cain assumes that other people are going to kill him. So like, it's easy to assume the worst in someone. And I project that onto someone like with my own negative thoughts. Like if I think that I, I'm a nerd, then I'm going to project that thought into others thinking that I'm a nerd. But if I'm a person who is willing to steal from people and do that, then I'm naturally going to be very paranoid that everybody is a stealer, that everybody's going to steal. Like I think we, we see that um, here. And I think that that's why I can't say any of those verses because I don't know them for this exercise. Sorry. Oh, this is tough. Um, yeah. Okay, so they're going to see me. He's assuming that other people are going to do what he has done. And now he knows the extent of this. This is bad. And God says, no, I'm going to put a mark on them. I'm going to warn them to try not to kill you. Not to my, anyone who might try to kill you. Okay, so Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Nod means wandering. Um, that's interesting. Cain left the Lord's presence. So again, you've got this physical presence of the Lord. Maybe. It's just the presence. I don't know. We know that at least he was present enough in whatever capacity, whether that's as a spirit, which we saw in Genesis 1, or just as this physical God walking around, which I have to not reference another verse. Never mind. Boy, this is hard. Uh, good challenge, Lord. Thank you. Um, so Cain left the Lord's presence, settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So he leaves the presence of God and this fellowship and this communication with God as he is banished and dealing with the punishment from taking the life of Abel. And he settles in the land of Nod, which means wandering um, east of Eden. So he's east of Eden now. And Cain goes to this land of Nod. Is there a city that's already established there, or is he going to set up a city there? Again, it's speculation on whether or not people, there were others, and there were other cities, and there were other fortifications, and whatever. But regardless, um, we keep moving here. Then Cain's wife became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and they named him Enoch. When Cain founded a city, so Cain founded a city, he named it Enoch after his son. So... <laughs> lots of questions right off the bat like where did this land of nod come from it just that's what it is now so we're calling it nod possibly um okay cain founds a city but even if he goes somewhere else because he's banished and he starts a city where did the wife come from is it a sister or is it at this point a cousin we don't know how old he is but like it gets really hairy there, where you're like, I don't know, or was she over in this land of Nod? And this is part of the others that he feared. All great questions, um, but I do want to be careful to, to say, to me, whether or not I know those things doesn't discount the fact that God created everything, that he, that all of this is true. Like, I I just want to be clear as I do that, because while I say, hey, doubts, doubts and questions are good, that's how we learn, we ask... I also want to be clear to say, I'm not asking this to go against God's word or to say, well, that doesn't make sense, Lord. That's not what I'm trying to do or incite or encourage in you. What I'm saying is, I think we can let a lot of details trip us up. Um, and I have a tendency to get tripped up in those things. But I find that it's much better for me to kind of zoom out and say, is that really an essential detail? Um, just because it wasn't listed doesn't mean that it's it's not something that exists, I guess. I don't know. If, if you're telling me a story about Dora the Explorer and her backpack, she might need a flashlight in that story, and I might have to hear about a flashlight in that backpack, which is essential. But that doesn't say, hey, there's nothing else in this backpack. Um, it's kind of that logic, and I have no clue why I went to Dora the Explorer, and I'm sorry, but... I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. And so we go back to this. I don't know why I went on that aside. Um, 
Okay, so Cain's wife becomes pregnant, gives birth to a son. They name him Enoch. When Cain founded a city, he named it Enoch after his son. So he eventually, at some point, founds a city, and he names it after his son Enoch. Enoch was the father of Erad. Erad was the father of Mahujael. Mahujael was the father of Methushael. Methushael was the father of Lamech. Now, um, this is where you start getting into kind of lineage. And this would have been important, I assume, uh, to the re readers of that day. Or if you're going to go through and start making a lot of notes about family trees and lineage. But um, it's there, and, and so, yeah. There we go. That's That's got to be important in some way. Lamech married two women, Ada and Zillah. Technically Ada, but uh, Ada and Zillah. Um, now, this is really interesting. Lamech, who like goes down genera generationally from Cain, marries two women. Not just one wife. And this is the first time that we see anything like that. And, you know, I don't know why, why suddenly you would have that practice, but that's interesting to note. Uh, Ada, or Ada, gave birth to a baby named Jabal. He became the first of the herdsmen who live in tents. The first of the herdsmen who live in tents. His brother's name was Jubal, the first musician, the inventor of the harp and the flute. So you have music coming out of this as well. Interesting. To Lamech's other wife, Zillah, was born Tubal Cain. He was the first to work with metal, forging instruments of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain had a sister named Nema. So you see this lineage coming down out of Cain. So, like, it's showing that, yeah, God banished him and he had this mark, but that mark clearly uh, kept him well enough to, to produce this family tree. And out of this family tree, you've got. Uh, this this man who marries two women, um, you've got one of of the sons from from one of the wives, a uh, herdsman who lives in tent. You got the first musician, inventor of the harp and flute for the other. And for the other wife, you have uh, the first to work with metal, forging instruments of, of bronze and iron, and uh, then a sister named Nema. So that's really interesting that you have this lineage that's listed. One day Lamech said to Ada and Zillah, Listen to me, my wives. I have killed a youth who attacked me and wounded me. So he is confessing to his wives here. I have killed a youth who attacked and wounded me. If anyone who kills Cain is to be punished seven times, anyone who takes revenge against me will be punished seventy-seven times. Now, this is interesting, because this tells us a couple of things. Um, anyone who kills Cain is to be punished seven times. That shows that Lamech and all of these the generation after uh, Cain know about the mark of Cain. So, like, Cain didn't hide that. It's clearly that warning sign, whatever it happens to look like or be, that is still known from the Lord God, and that is still, like, something that people acknowledge um, as this curse. So that's really interesting, but he, he's confessing, he's saying, okay, acknowledging, yeah, there's a curse. Um, anyone who kills Cain, they're going to get punished this way. But I'm saying anyone that takes revenge against me will be punished 77 times. What you see here is him kind of making his own law. Um, he knows the mark, okay, um, and he's making this call for, for vengeance um, in his own law. So that's really interesting. Um, and then it goes back to Adam. Uh, Adam slept with his wife again, and she gave birth to another son. She named him Seth. For she said, God has granted me another son in the place of Abel, the one Cain killed. you got to recognize that, that she's lost two sons at this point. Um, she named him Seth. Because, like... Abel gets killed, obviously, by Cain, and then Cain gets banished. So they have they have no children. She has Seth, and she says, God has granted me another son in the place of Abel, the one Cain killed. When Seth grew up, she had a, he had a son and named him Enosh. It was during his lifetime that people first began to worship the Lord. Now, God has granted me another son in the place of Abel. So this is an acknowledgement that, that she's still 
would call on the name of the Lord that, you know, when she had them before, uh, her children before, she's saying, you know, the Lord uh, has given, with the Lord's help, I have brought forth a man. So she's still recognizing this, has granted me another son. Okay, God has still done this. There's still an acknowledgement of God. And now there's a, a, an acknowledgement of, of worship going on and um, the idea of being in God's presence. So, man, that is really crazy stuff. I hope some new things popped out to you during this, and I hope you're enjoying this. I know that I am, and I'm enjoying digging into the Word with you and, and getting kind of fresh perspective on this stuff. A lot of really cool patterns are emerging here, and, um, yeah, just just a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. So, so, yeah, let's keep digging in.